Now, I've never been a big superhero or comics person. Sure, I know about the big names of DC and Marvel through cultural osmosis, but I am definitely not a connoisseur of comic books. And honestly, a lot of the convoluted, intense lore of comics tended to push me away, as it came across as less enticing and more intimidating. That said, there is one piece of superhero media that has always been near and dear to my heart. No, it's not the MCU. The DC Animated Universe. Well, more specifically, the Justice League animated series, as well as its successor, Justice League Unlimited. No dating for the Batman. It might cut into your brooding time. You're a princess from a society of immortal warriors. I'm a rich kid with issues. Lots of issues. And also Teen Titans. I will talk about her another time. The DCAU technically started with Batman the Animated Series back in, oh, holy shit, 1992? Why does that feel like five centuries ago? But Justice League came out in 2001 and ran until 2006, when I was a wee lad, ripe with a profound appreciation for colorful shows featuring kick-ass action scenes, most especially if they were led by or included badass women. And then later on in 2004, Wings Club basically sealed the deal. What can I say? The women of the DCAU are nothing if not iconic, memorable characters. Shaira stands, we ride at dawn. Let's let the men talk. They can talk all they like. As such, this is the property I am most familiar with in terms of DC. At some point, I would definitely like to visit the Batman and Superman animated series, but today I want to delve into Justice League specifically. Generally, we all seem to be having a strong superhero fatigue, both with the oversaturation of the Marvel Cinematic Universe and DC's repeated failures at creating their own equivalent. But the Justice League animated series has always been a delight to revisit, with me appreciating more and more details about its writing every time. Especially the fact that I've come to care for almost all of the characters, even the most obscure superheroes that I've literally never heard of or never expected to, you know, have given a shit about. And the show manages to toe the line between compelling, accessible, episodic storytelling that you don't have to be familiar with the lore to enjoy, and more complex overarching stories with easter eggs for the nerd girlies. Anyone can jump in and you don't need to do any homework to understand or enjoy the story, but you may get a bit more mileage if you are familiar with other entries of the DCAU, or just DC in general, or pop culture. They really love their pop culture uh, references in the show. Complex, mature, adult characters navigating complicated relationships and issues of identity, and even nuanced political storylines that a lot of live-action media brandishing itself as far more mature could only dream of matching. Justice League has it all, honey. And so today, we are going to go over what the show is, why it works, why I love it, and why it might be up your alley. Obviously, spoilers for the Justice League series, along with Unlimited and potentially other aspects of the DCAU that I have learned about through references and osmosis, all of that lies ahead. But like, if spoilers can ruin a story, was it even ever good to begin with? Before we begin, ciao! My name is Thomas, aka the Unicorn of War, and I like to make videos about whatever the fuck I feel like. I talk about the media I enjoy, I try to dissect why it works for me, or why certain elements of it bother me. It's all about complexity, nuance, emotional honesty, all that shit. If that sounds cool to you, then be sure to subscribe and ring that bell for notifications because YouTube hates creators. Also, please consider, if you are willing and able, pledging your support for myself and the channel over on Patreon where you will have access to early videos and video scripts, Patreon-exclusive content, and the private Union of War Discord server. Now, without further ado, let the chaos commence. The Justice League, as the name suggests, is meant to be a team of the most iconic and revered superheroes in DC Comics' roster. Originally introduced way back in an issue of 1960's The Brave and the Bold, and in truth going even further back to previous teams of hallowed heroes, the team comprised Superman, Batman, Wonder Woman, Green Lantern, The Flash, Martian Manhunter, and Aquaman all uniting to fight a giant alien starfish. Um, okay, sure. Uh, comics are gonna comic. Fight the ocean, I guess. 
I never trusted those starfish. Too many limbs. Where are their faces? Now, it only makes sense that if you have whole rosters of beloved heroes and accompanying villains, you would want to see them team up and clash with each other. Like a bunch of super friends? More like a Justice League. Do you have any idea how corny that sounds? With the creative team led by Bruce Timm having already created the Batman and Superman animated series, it only made sense for this to be the next step in the DCAU. If you are interested, there are entire docuseries dedicated to the production process for both Justice League and JLU detailing how the cast and crew brought such a difficult premise to life, including their admitted stumblings in the show's early days when they were going through the growing pains of expanding the scope of their stories and working with an ensemble cast. For instance, the continual nerfing of Superman in the first season when the writers wanted to emphasize or raise the stakes, in the process making Superman into a glorified punching bag. We got called on the carpet for making Superman a wimp. We were actually kind of using it as a kind of a dramatic crutch early on. It's like, oh, well, hey, if Superman can get taken down really, you know, right away, well, then now this is a really bad threat. We didn't realize it had become like a recurring gag. Ooh, that cannot be good for those age lines. The original Justice League series comprises two seasons, each clocking in at 26 episodes, 24 minutes. However, most of these episodes are not standalones. They are instead longer stories, usually stretched into two parts, with the premieres and finales usually expanding into three whole episodes. They'll still tell their own self-contained stories, including either all or select few members of the League, usually allowing one or two of them to take center stage in any given moment. Through this, all the characters get a chance to enjoy the limelight and become endeared to the audience, especially those who are new to the DCAU. Not to mention that a viewer can sit down and enjoy a longer 40-minute animated drama without necessarily having to be familiar with the rest of the show. God, I miss that era. Longer seasons, self-contained stories, take me back. The show also decided to remove any members of the supporting cast of each hero, instead dedicating the show entirely to the seven members of the League, with a rotating rogues gallery. This limitation is gradually lifted as the show goes on, but it was vital that Justice League forged its own identity out the gate by making these seven the story's foundation. No sidekicks, no civilian pals, just these seven heroes and their wacky, weird dynamics and relationships with each other. So the lineup here is mostly the same as the traditional roster, save for some changes to add a little diversity to the team. First up, we've got Superman as the de facto leader. Obviously. What is a Justice League without Superman at the helm? And now I'm having flashbacks to here after. Uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna keep going before I start crying. I'm gonna punch a hole in your head. Despite this, he's still quite experienced and a bit jaded from all he's seen in his superhero career. Now, having not seen the Superman animated series, all of my knowledge of this incarnation comes from Justice League. But I feel it only goes to show just how strong the writing here is overall that a newbie can waltz on in and still understand and love the character here. No previous knowledge required. Here, Superman is still a good noodle who wants to believe in the best in people and use his incredible powers to help and protect the innocent. He's not cynical or pessimistic at all, save that for Batman. But you can tell that he's a lot more self-aware and cautious as to the power that he wields. I feel like I live in a world made of cardboard, always taking constant care not to break something, to break someone never allowing myself to lose control, even for a moment, or someone could die. At the end of the day, Superman is just a normal guy trying to help people, which sadly is not as clear-cut as one would like to think, and Justice League doesn't shy away from that messiness, even on the political front. This gets more prominent in Unlimited, but I very much appreciate that while Superman struggles with what the right thing to do even is, he's still always trying his best. His earnestness is infectious, and his sincerity is incredibly refreshing, given the irony-poisoned era we have currently found ourselves in. Draga, the real test of honor isn't how you die, it's how you live. Though I'm not very familiar with comic book lore, there are a lot of readings of Superman as being Jewish coded, with Krypton being analogous to Jewish culture as a whole, being marginalized and continually threatened. Do you know what I've lost? What I've... In fact, Superman's creators, Jerry Siegel and Joe Shuster, were themselves Jewish. For somebody who goes into detail about this, I highly recommend Pillar of Garbage's video, Superman is Not Jesus. 
In terms of power, Superman kind of has it all. Super strength, flight, super speed, laser vision, the list can go on for days. His only weaknesses are kryptonite, red sun radiation, magic, and himbo brain. Because of this, the writers often struggled to introduce threats that could actually pose a real danger to him, as well as the six other heroes fighting by his side. This is remedied past the first season, though I have to respect the writers acknowledging this as a crutch that they had unintentionally relied upon and then working to correct it. It's actually really, really endearing seeing them talk so openly about this and gracefully fixing it and moving on. Uh, me from the future here. I'm going to talk about it later, but I just wanted to add into the Superman thing. I just rewatched for the man who has everything and uh, it oh that episode always destroys me i just seeing the fact that this man has lost so much and all he really wants is just a normal life and just also seeing like the culture that was taken away from him like ow i <sighs> mm. I'm in pain. Batman, meanwhile, is a broody boy who counterbalances Superman's optimism. Bats means well, but he's been through so much, even outside of his superhero persona, it just weighs on him mentally. Batman hasn't arrived. Have you spoken with him? He's still not answering calls. He doesn't handle loss very well. He has a very difficult time admitting how much he cares about his friends. Hell, I'm not even sure he would refer to the other Justice League members as friends, given he'd probably expect the universe to take them the second he said the word. What about you, Batman? I'm not really a people person. But when you need help, and you will, call me. He has his moments, though, like in the episode epilogue, where we see a flashback to him and a character named Ace. Ace is a young girl who has the ability to warp reality with her mind, but because of this, she's going to die soon, the backlash of which could kill everyone else in range of her power. Batman is tasked with killing her before that happens, but he doesn't. I'm dying very soon. Yes. I'm sorry. Instead, he sits with her on a swing set, not lying about or sugarcoating her fate, but also wanting to keep her company in the face of it. Would you stay with me? I'm scared. This is an absolute treasure of tragedy for Batman stands. At least I imagine so, because I know it is for me. This is a quintessential Batman moment for me, and one of the many reasons this incarnation of the character is my go-to. Beneath all of the trauma, all of the broodiness, all the pessimism and cynicism, Batman does have a heart of gold. So when it occasionally shines through all the darkness, it stands out even more. Likewise, his broodiness and lack of needing to be seen as good or nice allows him to call people out for their behavior, be it friend or foe. We know he used you humiliated you, brainwashed you, wound you up like a tin soldier, and turned you loose against Earth. Cry me a river. When Superman and the other leaguers look like they're veering towards letting their power go to their heads, Batman is the first person to call them out for it. Passing judgment like gods, with our superpowered army and our orbiting death ray? Cadmus is right to be scared. The human race wouldn't stand a chance. And when a foe, say, makes an excellent case for fearing the Justice League going rogue and taking over the world, Batman doesn't get defensive. I'll get into it when we get to Unlimited, but by God, he and Amanda Waller have a rivalry for the history books. You've got a spaceship floating over our heads with a laser weapon pointing down. In another dimension, seven of you overthrew the government and assassinated the president. We're the good guys, protecting our country from a very real threat. You. Even without powers, Batman is able to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with any opponent. Not only thanks to his many gadgets, but his wits. He knows how to outsmart an enemy, using their weaknesses or even their strengths against them. As the detective of the group, he's often the one to uncover the truth of the matter. And as the local good billionaire, he helps bankroll the Justice League to create and maintain the Watchtower. All he cares about is money. Well, it takes money to do what we do. And not everyone's independently wealthy. Insert obligatory tax the shit out of billionaires mantra. There's never a moment Batman feels useless or underpowered compared to his allies. In fact, I tend to count on him more often considering all of his skills. Now we move on to the five new characters, starting with Diana, aka Wonder Woman. 
Allow me. Talented, brilliant, incredible, amazing, show-stopping, spectacular. In Justice League, she is not an established superhero like the others. Instead, she begins the show living as the Princess of Themyscira, the mystical hidden home island of the Amazons. Sensing the danger threatening the rest of the world, Diana disobeys her mother's laws and leaves, stealing sacred armor in order to help stop the approaching darkness. These omens don't bode well, Mother. Mankind may be facing its darkest hour. Then mankind will have to face it alone. How can you say that? Whatever happens beyond these shores is not our concern. To my knowledge, Wonder Woman's backstory changes a bit between versions, both in how she came to be and how she gets her armor. Here, Diana steals the armor from the Amazon's temple, and presumably these enhance her warrior abilities and super strength, while also granting her the power of flight. Plus, you know, silver cuffs to deflect bullets and boomerang tiara. Very Sailor Moon coded of you, Diana. The lasso actually does not have its ability to compel someone to tell the truth for most of the series. Because Diana stole her armor, she doesn't fully know what it's capable of, and I guess neither do the writers. Because she really only uses the truth power like one time in Unlimited and that's it. Tell me your name. Abnegazer. Tell me where to find Faust, Abnegazer. In Hades Library. I guess they weren't sure how to integrate it into the story. The lasso serves plenty of practical functions at least, and spices up her combat compared to the others. But I would have liked her having the truth power for the whole show. How'd you do that? Magic lasso. Who knew? If you don't want to tell me, fine. Now, I've recently realized that when a character is a fish out of water and struggles to understand the normal world, they tend to be one of my favorites. There's just something about a character struggling with implicit social cues and norms that I find deeply relatable. Which, uh, check that off on the should have known I was neurodivergent sooner list. Penny from Ruby, Mila from Tales of Zillia, and definitely Diana. It's like some kind of temple. Yes, for those who worship their credit cards. Hailing from Themyscira, Diana struggles to understand how man's world works. She's quite curious about the people here in the outside world, is in conflict with her frustration with a patriarchal society, full of not only misogynistic, arrogant men with all the power, but also women who have basically been taught to kowtow and please these men. Why would anyone want to cover up her natural beauty? Easy for you to say, Miss Cheekbones. What I'm saying is that Pearl, like, you know, ultimate pick-me Pearl, who has the personality of rancid milk, would drive Diana up the goddamn wall. Diana carries herself with a certain regality. She is graceful in and outside of combat, yet there's also this deep capacity for righteous fury and violence when she perceives wrongdoing and injustice. When she gets angry, she gets scary. I've learned my lesson. No, you haven't. <laughs> Your kind never learns, and it's really starting to get on my nerves. And she can very easily let her anger take control of her, especially later on in the series as she becomes more and more jaded by man's world. Still, that anger is arguably sourced by a deep compassion for people and living things. She wants a peaceful, happy world where things are equal and fair for all, so perceiving injustice pisses her off. Come on, I'm late for a doctor's appointment! Keep your shirt on, lady. I'm on a break. Hey! Oh! Next time, mind your manners. Because she sees it as people standing in the way of happiness for all for the sake of their own egos. Arguably, at the core of this struggle is her relationship with her mother, Queen Hippolyta. Hippolyta is a loving, albeit stern mother, who struggles between her duties as a mother and her duties as the Amazon Queen. When Diana defies her mother's orders and leaves Themyscira, and then returns to the island to save her with Justice League's help, Diana winds up breaking Themyscira in law by exposing the island to men. Her mother thusly banishes her, and though Diana is clearly distraught, she accepts her mother's decree and leaves. It is with a heavy heart that I must exile you from Themyscira. The fates were against us, mother. Goodbye. They do still see each other here and there, but it isn't until Unlimited when Hippolyta decides to defy the will of the gods to allow Diana to visit the Mascara and spend time with her. We don't get to see much of it, but it's enough to make me feel elated for Diana after having spent so much time away from home. The fact that she was willing to accept being banished from her home because of her dedication to helping the world at large, I just have to admire that resolve, but 
also empathize with all the heartbreak that comes with that. Next up is Green Lantern. Usually the lantern that people think of first is Air Force pilot Hal Jordan. Oh, why did I say it like that? Hail, Hail Jordan. But in Justice League, they instead went with former Marine John Stewart. As such, John is usually my default Green Lantern and I am mad about that. <laughs> Part of the reason was to add some diversity because you know, having a team of seven where like none of them are black is wild. Like, where is the melanin? But in terms of personality, John is probably the most uptight of the bunch, but equally one of the most experienced in terms of combat. You are no fun. This isn't supposed to be fun. We've got a job to do and we will do it better without distractions. Understood? John is the straight man usually calling out the others for not pulling their weight or making light of a situation. In most cases, that's with Flash, since, you know, Flash is a goddamn clown. But that just makes their friendship so much more wholesome. You believed in me, even when I didn't believe in myself. Hey, what are friends for? But he's also got conflicts with Diana, usually for her inexperience. We'll have to take out those factories. Lady, this is no job for amateurs. We Amazons are warriors born. Want to test me? And with Hawk Girl for, well, the way they clash since they're so much alike. What exactly is your problem anyway? Your attitude, girl. Is everyone on Thanagar as thick headed as you? Thick headed? Why, you self righteous green eyed. Though Hawk Girl usually has an easier time bringing levity to a situation. Though John can be tough on people, it's because he knows how dangerous the Justice League's job is. One slip up could be all it takes to lose someone forever. He's a sort of group dad who's always trying to keep everybody on task and is often fed up with her antics, but he can be a total marshmallow when he's laid back. Hey, what was that for? It's supposed to be fun. Okay, let's have fun. Whoa! And quite the flirt when it comes to someone he fences. I thought I saw trouble over here. There's no trouble. Sure there is. And I'm looking right at it. As you would expect, John has the usual Green Lantern powers. His ring provides him with the ability to create constructs of green energy, albeit with no clear weakness to the color yellow. I'm pretty sure it did make it in there somewhere as like a little Easter egg, but they didn't make a big deal of it. Yeah, it would kind of clash with the tone they were going for, but there, I feel like there has to be an Easter egg in there somewhere because fucking nerds made this. His constructs are usually limited to generic energy beams and shields in the first season since the writers figured John would be a lot more practical than the other lanterns, but they quickly realized this was fucking boring. And then they let him get more creative with his powers from season two onward. We love learning from our mistakes. Now, the Flash? He is my boy, and I would die for him. In this case, it's local redhead Wally West. But I'm not sure I'm ready to- Wally West, Clark Kent, Bruce Wayne, show off. And yeah, he's a total fuckboy. He's a massive flirt, but thankfully he never really comes off as an invasive creep, at least to me. Flash just has a lot of love to share. He's, he's a dumb slut, but, but he's my dumb slut. If you're afraid to talk to her, I'll tell her for you. Don't! You are so very sad. He's goofy and lighthearted, full of comic relief, but not to an insufferable degree. Flash is the heart of the team. He's the one keeping everybody grounded, keeping them from falling into complete despair and cynicism. And he's a complete sweetheart. Here's the deal, buddy. Tell me where those guys went and I promise to come see you in the hospital. We'll play darts. The soft kind. Okay. They're gonna ambush you at the Flash Museum. See, that's all we needed. Flash and Substance is one of my favorite episodes, solely because it showcases just what a wholesome bean this boy is. I adore his friendships with the other leaguers, especially with John, Hawkgirl, and Diana. He and Hawkgirl specifically have this brother-sister dynamic going on that is just, it, it's, it's the epitome of wholesomeness. Lots of teasing, lots of, oh my god, Flash, stop giving me fucking heart attacks. Don't you ever scare me like that again. She loves me. She's like the big sister I never had. Only, you know, short. And yeah, Flash has super speed. Usually it's a power I tend not to enjoy, but I think the show does a great job making him feel interesting still in combat. There are hints to the greater capabilities that this power could grant Flash, like phasing through matter, but it's done through a body swap that also shows the danger of such abilities which is precisely why Flash keeps himself in check, thank you very much. Our sixth member is the Martian Manhunter, though here he is primarily referred to as Jean Jones. It's a bit odd that we have a John and a Jean, 
but the key for the Martian one is to make it sound French. Because Mars is France, I guess. Wee oui, wee, oui, on Mars we had baguette. Much like Diana, Jean is a fish out of water. He's the last Martian, having lost his people to an invading alien species, and this event is basically the central plot of the premiere episodes. The attack was successful, but the cost was dear. I was the only survivor, the last of my kind. His mission is to avenge his people and prevent Earth from befalling the same tragedy as Mars. Once that's done, he is welcomed into the League as his new home by the others. Specifically, his interactions with Superman are so cute, because even though Supes was raised by loving parents, he still knows what it is like to have lost your world and to be the last of your people. Jean, we can never replace the family you've lost, but we'd be honored if you could learn to call Earth your home. Jean is not very expressive at first, but that's just because it takes him a while to figure out how human customs and culture work. It reminds me a lot of Tecna in Winx Club, where once Jean begins picking up and mimicking human mannerisms, it is the cutest, most adorable thing you'll ever fucking see. Kitty. His cold, seemingly apathetic exterior it really is just a misunderstanding as he deeply cares for his newfound family and is hurt whenever they're in conflict with each other. It's not just the men you stuck up- Stop it! Stop it right now! I arrived here not knowing a soul and you took me in. You became my new family. Specifically, his friendship with Diana is so cute. Sean! Good to see you, Diana. I've got a lot to tell you about. We'll catch up later. Wouldn't miss it. That detachment, however, actually comes to a head during Unlimited, where Jean fully steps away from the field and instead becomes an overseer, organizing the Justice League as a whole into teams for different missions. But uh, he he uses this as an excuse to this stay in the Watchtower and never go to Earth. Basically, Jean was chronically online before even being online was a thing. Diana calls him out for this, clocking Jean's distaste for humanity. The reason you aren't on the ground protecting humanity is because you don't want to be. You don't actually like humanity all that much, do you? I don't dislike them. And we do see this a bit earlier on in Tabula Rasa, which I will rave about later, where Jean accidentally opens himself up telepathically to all nearby humans and is deafened by their shallowness, their pettiness, and their woes. Do I have to tell anyone what's But likewise, he also hears the concern and compassion of humans out late looking for a lost little girl in the woods. I'm freezing my butt off and I don't even know the kid, but I know how I feel if she was my little girl. Stay up all night if I have to. I don't care what it takes. I wish it were me instead of her. Only six years old. He gets to hear that duality of the human heart directly and gets a first-hand understanding of just how strange and complex humanity is. And though this doesn't make humanity inherently awful, it can be exhausting to deal with, making me get why he would just become more reclusive, especially given my introverted tendencies. What I'm trying to say is, Jean absolutely, again, is a chronically online individual. He'd be making memes about hating human contact, hating socializing, and I think he'd make a pretty good shit poster. Power-wise, Jean can fly and turn intangible, but his main ability is shape-shifting. He is able to transform himself to look and sound like anybody else, which is incredibly useful for subterfuge. Sounds like you're going to have company in prison. The kryptonite won't protect you any longer. Not to mention it does have combat applications like turnify, turnifying, turnifying. Did I just invent a word turnifying, turnipifying? Anyhow, he can turn into a horrifying Martian dragon. It haunts my nightmares. And then we have my favorite DCAU character overall, Hawk Girl, AKA Shaira Hall. Stay back. Oh. Whoa. What? There's a time for words and a time for action. Now you're probably wondering, whom's to the fuck is Hawk Girl? Where's Aquaman? Or even Hawkman, who's this? See, the writers didn't want Wonder Woman to be the only gal on the team, which 
was the correct move. And they actually had big plans for Hawk Girl, as we will discuss later on, and so she was given the seventh slot. Personality-wise, Shaira is a lot of fun. Fastest man alive. Which might explain why you can't get a date. Yeah. Hey! Her alleged backstory, more on that later, is that she hails from the far-off world of Thanagar, where she was a detective who was inadvertently sent to Earth while apprehending criminals. She's another fish out of water, but she's had a bit more time before the series began to acclimate to her new environment. Five years to be precise, keep that in mind, remember that. Shaira is a total hothead. She is strong-willed, she is stubborn, blunt, and unafraid to speak her mind, but she never comes off as malicious or mean. She calls things as she sees them. She takes situations seriously, but she also knows not to take them too seriously, lest she psych herself out. It doesn't make sense to jump to either conclusion. Let's just see what he has to say. You ever get chafed straddling the fence all the time? It creates this very nice middle ground where she's able to bridge the approaches of the other characters while still being able to clash with them. Now, I really really want to go on about why I adore her character, but it involves a lot of spoilers for the finale of Justice League and for Unlimited. We will get to them, rest assured, but trust me when I say she is a masterclass in how to do a betrayal and subsequent redemption arc. She is the Zuko that never got her flowers, okay? Naturally, she can fly, you know, hawk wings, but her main weapon is her mace. And let me tell you, I was obsessed with this thing as a child. Not only can it crack skulls, but it can also channel electrical currents. <laughs> and on top of that, it is made of nth metal, which is basically anti-magic. It's made of nth metal. Your people's technology was developed specifically to repel magical creatures. This makes her super useful when she's up against a mystical opponent, because her mace sees the magic and goes, um, yeah, none of that, thank you. Uh, absolutely not. I've got Aquaman, you take the magician. Your mace seems to be giving him fits. Just for the record, I didn't start this fight. First time for everything. And even without the mace, she'll still kick your ass. No weapons! No weapons! You think I need this mace to take you down? Oh. Now, let's talk about some of my favorite episodes from these two seasons. It is honestly hard to pick, given I enjoy the vast majority of them, but we're going to narrow it down to the absolute best. You know, minus Starcrossed, because that gold deserves its own section. Legends follows Hawkgirl, John, Jean, it, wow, it's really hard to say their names back to back, and Flash being sent into what at first appears to be the past, but in truth is another dimension modeled after classic comic book superheroes. When I was a kid, my Uncle James had the biggest comic book collection I'd ever seen. I'd go to his house every day after school and we'd read old comics all afternoon. They were the stars of my favorite comic book, The Justice Guild of America. While they are original creations for the show, at least to my knowledge, the Justice Guild of America, Green Guardsman, Streak, Tom Turbine, Catman, and Black Siren, are inspired by the Justice Society of America from the real-life golden age of comics. Trapped here for a time, the Justice League finds themselves aiding these aggressively 1950s-style heroes, all the while wondering how this is possible given these are actually comic book characters that John grew up idolizing. I know it sounds corny, but those comics taught me what it meant to be a hero. Without them, well, maybe I wouldn't have this ring today. They soon discovered that this world is, in truth, a post-apocalyptic one. The Justice Guild and even the city are illusions created by Rey, the young ward of the guild, who was mutated by the effects of the war that devastated this world. The radioactive fallout from the nuclear war mutated his DNA, giving him the psychic ability to mold this world to his choosing. So he chose to recreate it with the heroes he worshipped as a child. Who could blame him? Ray has essentially been creating a dream world where everything is fine, and even threatening the other survivors into carrying out his fantasy. I think WandaVision, except Wanda is fully aware of what she's doing, and also with less iconic musical numbers. And sadly, no Agatha. The Justice League managed to stop Rey, but this sadly requires the Justice Guild sacrificing themselves, given they are just figments of Rey's imagination. We died once to save this Earth, and we can do it again. This one is something I think a lot of superhero and comics fans would love, 
recognizing plenty of Easter eggs and references to the goofy, campy vibes of Era's past. I definitely enjoy that, but I am also obsessed with the twist of everything being this delusive world created as a way to cope with the harsh reality. Next up is Tabula Rasa, in which Superman's nemesis Lex Luthor is on the run, coming across a powerful android named Amazo. Amazo's creator, Dr. Ivo, has passed away, and Luthor takes it upon himself to manipulate Amazo into helping him eliminate the Justice League. You miss him. So do I. He was one of my best friends. He was? Almost like a brother. And he would have wanted me to look after you if anything ever happened to him. We'll talk about him later, but Lex Luthor... Whew, one of the most insidious, best villains in media. I hate this man. But damn if he is not compelling. The title of the episode comes from a Latin phrase, because obviously if it's Latin it must be deep in shit. Tabula rasa basically amounts to clean slate. It is a blank canvas free of preconceived notions and biases, much like a mezzo given he is essentially a newborn left to fend for himself after the death of his creator. A mezzo has the power to not only mimic, but also take on the abilities of those he encounters. He copies Hawkgirl's wings and mace, Diana and Superman's super strength, Green Lantern's energy powers, and so on, making him an incredibly dangerous, versatile, nigh-unbeatable enemy. Oh! Oh, you forgot to mention he's as strong as I am. He wasn't like that before. And even worse, he is constantly evolving. Batman is initially able to use kryptonite against him since he inherited Superman's weaknesses along with his powers, but Amazo soon evolves to become immune to said weakness. But I also adapt and evolve. It is not through brute force that Amazo is defeated. He isn't even really defeated to begin with. Instead, Jean, who has been struggling the whole time with the aforementioned telepathy problem, allows Amazo to copy his abilities, which reveals Luthor's manipulation. So you lied to me. What? I can read your mind, Lex. Sparing Luthor, Amazo leaves Earth to expand his power and knowledge of the cosmos. But he'll be back. He will be back. Ooh, girl. I don't care how much power he has. He's no god. Then why do I have a feeling that if he ever comes back, you're going to be doing a lot of praying? The fights and stakes of this episode are a joy to watch, but I'm mostly here for Jean's struggle with whether he now hates humanity, and Amazo realizing Luthor is a manipulative human trash can. They parallel each other quite nicely. It is an episode showcasing both the best and worst of humanity, and taking that duality in stride. Next up, one I have rewatched an unhealthy number of times, The Terror Beyond. <laughs> AKA Superman and the gals fight Cthulhu. Oh, I'm sorry, Cthulhu. Aquaman, who by the way is an absolute long haired bad bitch in this show, Jesus Christ. King of the seas, remember? Bale's local zombie Solomon Grundy out of trouble, working with the powerful sorcerer Dr. Fate to sacrifice Grundy in order to prevent horrifying Eldritch abominations from invading Earth. You know, a Tuesday. Naturally, the League is not keen on the idea of sacrifice, even if it is a zombie criminal like Grundy. And so we decide to go punch Budge of Cthulhu in the face, in the process debating... Faith? Ixthultu gave us agriculture, mathematics, philosophy, the foundations of our entire culture. But something changed. You stopped believing in him. Yes. Modern Thanagarians bow down to no higher power. Yeah, this episode has a lot to do with the struggle of faith in the face of incomprehensible evil and tragedy. You see, Hawk Girl reveals that in ancient times, her people, the Thanagarians, worshipped Cthulhu in return for helping their civilization flourish. And as payment, he would take the souls of their people as sacrifices. My tribute was equitable. I earned your faith. What's a fair price for the souls of my ancestors? Would you like to learn how to farm? That will be 500 newborn souls, please. But eventually, the Thanagarians turned on Cthulhu, driving him out, likely using their nth metal technology, and vowing to never bow to another higher power. Hawkgirl is basically an atheist, even making a comment on how Diana is always asking Hera and the other Greek gods for strength. Give me strength! Do you have 
to say that all the time. But it's more than that. It's a sincere conversation about the role of faith in providing comfort and hope and how people cling to it in difficult times. Do you really gain strength when you call on your gods? Of course I do. My beliefs sustain me. That must be comforting. Personally, I'm an agnostic. I'm open to the idea of something more being out there, but I generally feel each person has to find the answer for themselves. I cannot stand people shoving their own beliefs onto others, which, surprise, surprise, makes me not a very big fan of institutional organized religion. So I very much get Hawk Girl's vibe, but I do appreciate this vulnerable moment between her and Diana and how Diana actually levels with Hawk Girl about how difficult it must be to move through life without believing there is a higher power looking out for her. There are times when faith is all we have to rely upon. I don't know how you can bear the weight all alone. Really, the heart of the episode is Grundy and Hawk Girl's friendship. These two have had no connection whatsoever before this episode, but here, Hawk Girl watches out for Grundy when he's in trouble and Grundy reciprocates. Bird Nose helps Grundy, but Bird Nose and her friends hate Grundy. Grundy help Birdnose, Birdnose help Grundy, okay? Excuse me, hot girl smash. Grundy isn't evil, he's just very easily influenced and quick to anger. He's basically lost his soul and has come to believe that Ichthultu is the one holding on to it. While trying to save Hawkgirl from Ichthultu, Grundy descends into his goddamn brain, thinking he can pry out his soul, becoming gravely injured in the process. Hawkgirl then finishes off Ichthultu on his behalf. Ichthultu still has faith in you. So do I. Her staying with him in his final moments? Ooh, it gets to me. She doesn't believe in anything like souls or the afterlife, but she plays along because she knows it's what Grundy believes. Do you think Grundy's soul is waiting for him? Grundy, I don't believe. Yes, it's waiting for you. It is a bittersweet moment because in the end, Hawkgirl still just doesn't understand any of this. But I think Aquaman puts it best. He was happy at the end. I still don't understand why. It's faith, Hawk Girl. You're not supposed to understand it. You just have it. I just... Whew, I love this episode. I, I love it so bad. And really, I appreciate that Hawk Girl is not made out to be the bad guy, because usually in media, when the question of faith is brought to the table, the atheist or atheist adjacent character is usually the one portrayed as an arrogant and closed-minded fool. And let's be real, atheism is never really seen or discussed as the absence of a religion or faith. It's always defined as antagonistic towards Christianity specifically. It's like all the other religions just don't exist, I guess. But none of that is the case here at all. Nobody has the answers, really, be it the faithful or those without. It's just imperfect, confused people doing their best in a world where bad shit just happens. No matter what they believe or don't believe, they can always lean on each other. And then, a better world. Who, girl, this one's a doozy. It starts off with the Justice League storming the White House. Oh dear, we're going there, aren't we? Lex Luthor has become president, presumably ruining everything and starting World War III because he sucks. And worse, Flash is dead. We don't know the details, but everyone is past their breaking point. Luthor lectures Superman about how his morality is just a facade. At least that's how Luthor sees it, because he's a disingenuous, deceitful fuck. You could have crushed me any time you wanted. And it wasn't the law or the will of the people that stopped you. It was your ego. Being a hero was too important to you. You're as much responsible for this as I am. But in this moment, Supes loses it and crosses the line, finally killing Luthor to permanently remove him as a threat. I did love being a hero, but if this is where it leads, I'm done with it. 12 seconds later. Do you smell something? Following this, the Justice League become the Justice Lords ruling over the world with an iron fist and imposing their idea of order on everyone in the name of preventing crime and tragedy. However, this also means that nobody has rights anymore. It's kind of a fall tradition, you know? Like Halloween and football. An election isn't like football. There's a lot more to lose. So when do you think might be a good time to have one? 
Patience, Mr. President. There's no more voting, no more elections, no more civil rights, strict curfews, keeping people home. They can't even keep in touch with each other without permission. Sorry, Miss Lane, but you know the rules. No leaving the premises, no unauthorized guests, no phone calls. Can't speak my mind, can't think. It's only temporary, ma'am. They gave us their word. Sucker. And protesting for basic liberties uh, goes about as well as you would expect. It's a dismal look at how these heroes, believing they're doing the right thing, have been pushed into becoming authoritarians. What's more, the episode waits until halfway through part one to reveal, psych, <laughs> this isn't our Justice League. This is an alternate dimension where shit went sideways. But now the Justice Lords are looking to invade our dimension, get our Justice League out of the way, and impose their dictatorship upon two worlds. The audacity. Well, really, it's giving that they're doing this to justify their conquest to themselves. It's a sobering episode that shows how good intentions can quickly spiral into their own kind of evil. Because in our own world, the actual bad guys rarely see themselves that way and usually do what they do in the name of their idea of order or utopia. That scene of Batman versus Batman debating over this new reality. Who elected you anyway? The problem with democracy is it doesn't keep you very safe. Lord Batman. Wow, it feels weird saying that. Justifying this regime by citing his trauma. You grabbed power. And with that power, we've made a world where no eight-year-old boy will ever lose his parents because of some punk with a gun. Goosebumps. But then later on in the episode, League Batman showcasing the absolute insanity of day-to-day -day living in the world that he has created. I'll pay it, whatever it is, and the food, it was good, really. Mom and Dad, they'd be so proud of you. Chills. And I also really just appreciate the fact that this emphasizes how much Flash was grounding the rest of them into not going insane. Like, even the fact that Flash fakes his death and it freaks out Lord Batman that much, like... Ooh, girl. It has to do with what happened to this world's Flash. You mean he's... All this had to have been set off by something. And then seeing Lord Soups being ready to kill Flash, I... Ugh. I'm the last piece of your conscience. And this is the one thing you'll never do. I've done a lot of things I thought I'd never do these last two years. One more won't hurt. It really just shows how far Superman could have sunk if this reality was the one he inhabited. It's it's depressing, man. But you know what? It also makes me love Flash more. And this episode also has ripple effects. It informs one of the story arcs in Unlimited, asking questions about power, morality, law. The shadow of the Justice Lords hangs over the rest of the series, as it should. It is a reminder of the dangers of overreaching, of just how easy it is to slip into authoritarianism so long as you perceive yourself as the good guy, without actually thinking as to the effects of what you're doing and why you're doing it to begin with. And finally, to lighten the mood, because we are all deeply depressed by this point probably, we've got our only one-parter, Comfort and Joy. It's a Christmas episode, thank God. It's literally just the characters pairing off, enjoying various holiday-related shenanigans. Superman goes home to see his parents and Jean tags along. My name is Jean. I'm a Martian. Oh, we're no strangers to aliens in this house. Flash tries to get a present for some sad orphans, enlisting the help of the villain Ultra Humanite because, well, even villains better watch out for the holidays. And Hawkgirl takes John on a cute date to a violent alien bar because she loves fighting. Amazing. What the hell is Diana doing for Christmas? Probably crying about how much she misses home, but it doesn't seem anybody else cares all that much, so she'll be fine. Batman's gone too, so... Who knows? Maybe local billionaire fuckboy Bruce Wayne is off at some fancy-ass Christmas party, and if he's a proper gentleman, he'll have invited Diana, but you know, that's just me being Wonder Bat trash. This episode is just so cute. I appreciate getting to see characters I love existing outside the plot. Snowball fights, shape-shifting to fit cozy oversized sweaters, and crying over aluminum Christmas trees of all things! Girl, sign me the fuck up. Not to mention, given it's the penultimate episode, we desperately needed something this lighthearted before the show destroyed our spirits. Now, you'll probably notice, well, if you're uh, familiar with the show, you'll have noticed, pretty much all of my choices, save for one, are from the second season, and that is for good reason. Season one was still enjoyable and a great introduction to the show, but the writers really hit their stride in season two. And a huge part of that is the introduction of the late, great Dwayne McDuffie. 
Duane's writing was often praised for focusing on the humanity of comic book characters, and you can see that with not only the introduction of character arcs through the show's second season, but just little moments of humanity from all the characters, not even just the Seven Leaguers. Above all else, Duane understood how to effectively communicate a character's individual personality, motivation, and role, and that is what helps elevate season two. The plot gave us an excuse to have them fight, but it also gave our characters an excuse to talk about how they really feel about each other. The things that they're saying about their relationships they and really how they mean. feel about each other, they all mean it. Legit, I could listen to this man talk about writing for hours, and I, <laughs> I kind of did while researching the show's production. Themes reveal themselves. Dwayne, you muse. If you want to learn more about him, I'll have some videos I used in my research linked down in the description, but suffice to say, this man was a legend and very much still is posthumously. Also, utter icon and revolutionary in terms of rep in comics. The bitches were calling him woke, like before they even learned what the word woke was. And he was a king. He was unapologetic. He was like, yeah, I was a black kid and I wanted to see people like me as superheroes. Everyone deserves to see themselves as superheroes, not just the white guys. And if you have a problem with that, go fuck yourself. Ah, <laughs> uh, what an icon. Ah, uh, bless that man. And now the series finale of Justice League and one of the most devastating pieces of media I've ever endured. Truly, this one is a game changer, uprooting so many elements of our status quo and leaving us still alive, but completely broken and reeling. Up until this point, there has been a bit of a romance blooming between John and Hawkgirl. As I've mentioned before, they clash a lot, but that chemistry also involves a lot of deep affection and love for one another. And by this point, they're dating and they're fucking cute. After we're done, let's get some takeout from that Chinese place near your apartment. Great, but this time, no eel heads. Lightweight. I live for their banter because now they know that they can count on each other to where they allow themselves to relax and let their guards down. And for John specifically, that's a big deal and also Concerning for what's coming, oh god. But, uh, there's a bit of a problem. See, an alien warship kind of appears on Earth, which the Justice League finds themselves helpless and unable to stop. And, you know, through the whole thing, Hawkgirl seems to know a lot about the ship and how it works. It's a Gordanian Class 7 cruiser. A what? Watch out for the plasma cannons! Ah! Uh, interesting. Thankfully, another ship takes it down, and the pilots reveal themselves to be Thanagarians, just like Hawkgirl. And she knows them. Welcome to Earth, Commander. Thank you, Lieutenant. This is Commander Ro Talik of Thanagar. The Hawkmen are the Thanagarian military, led by Commander Ro Talik. They've been locked in a bloody conflict with another alien race known as the Gordanians, who have supposedly set their sights on Earth. And so the Thanagarians have arrived to help use their technology to protect Earth. And moreover, Hawkgirl lied about her origins. In truth, Shaira is a lieutenant in the Thanagarian military, sent here as a spy to scout Earth's weaknesses ahead of time in preparation for this occupation. She's even been documenting the weaknesses of the League and providing them to the Thanagarians, with even more red flags raised for Batman when Jean mentions he's never been able to read Hawkgirl's mind. Maybe you should have read her mind. Actually, it's strange. But I never could. In fact, I can't read any of their minds. Or the mind of any Thanagarian, for that matter. <laughs> I'm sure, I'm sure that's not, <laughs> I'm sure that won't bite us in the ass at all. I'm sure that's not a problem. I'm, I'm sure that's fine. And because we need even more drama, Shair turns out to be engaged to Ro and was trying to avoid a relationship with John for most of the series because of this. But now, right as she and John are together, Ro is back in the picture. And John is not taking it too well, reasonably so. The most mysterious creatures in the universe. Sorry? Women. Oh god, Batman, no wonder you ended up alone, Jesus. But uh, surprise, surprise, the Thanagarians are lying. They are lying liars. But I know a frozen liver when I see one. What? The crew of this ship was dead long before the Thanagarians shot them down. 
I think we've been set up. The Gordanians are nowhere near Earth, and when exposed, the Thanagarians turn on the military and subsequently imprison the Justice League by exploiting their weaknesses. And it's also in this moment Shahira makes her loyalties clear. Whose side are you really on? Oh, there goes his jaw. Ooh. Oh, that cannot be good. So now, the Thanagarians have fully occupied the Earth and placed it under martial law, making an alleged barrier to protect the planet. But if the Gordanians aren't involved, what is it for then? Well, as it turns upside down, the true goal of the Thanagarians is to create what is called a hyperspace bypass a dimensional bridge which will allow them to jump behind the Gordanian fleet and invade their homeworld. The problem is that they need several planets to create this bridge, including Earth, and when the bridge is created, all of these worlds will be destroyed. For Thanagar to live, Earth must die. And Shaira never knew apparently she did not get the briefing on this she was told the exact same cover story that the earthlings were presumably because her superiors knew that she would likely get emotionally attached to the earth while she was here and thus would not be willing to cooperate if she knew of its fate the whole time i mean really it's to keep her sympathetic but you know i don't mind this she turns on ro trying to reason with him into sparing the earth but ro is determined to destroy the gordanians at any cost and they've come too far to stop. Every moment we delay is equal in the blood of our people. That still doesn't give us the right. Apparently, Hero has never heard of the sunk cost fallacy. The League, naturally, escapes and makes their way to Bruce's estate, in the process revealing their secret identities to each other. It is actually such a cute moment that I desperately needed in this episode, and it really shows the level of trust and camaraderie they've all built with each other through the entire show. And so, deciding to betray her people in order to save Earth, Shaira reveals the truth to the Justice League and returns John's Green Lantern ring. I did what I thought was right then, and that's what I'm doing now. Crow's advisor and professional evil vizier, Krager, unfortunately catches her in this, and Fro arrests Shaira. Fro's main focus is on possessing and getting Shaira back from John, determined to destroy the Earth to ensure that she has no reason to leave him, because he is trash. If you want me, I'm yours. All you have to do is spare the Earth. Perhaps you'll forget him once Earth is nothing but a memory. So the League goes into action. Batman rams the Watchtower from space into the Earth to destroy the Bypass, assuming he will die in the process, but Supes has to bail him out of trouble because he ain't about to let his bad bestie burn up like a chicken nugget. Always have to be the hero, don't you? Right back at you. Elsewhere, Diana comes across Shaira and frees her, but in the most iconic fuck you for double-crossing us way imaginable. I should leave you to burn. Yeah, uh, D Diana's, uh, Diana's not feeling great about this. Uh, she is not going to be forgiving this shit uh, anytime soon. Together, John and Shaira take down Fro and help lower the barrier around the bypass, allowing Batman to, you know, destroy the thing. With it gone, Fro orders the Thanagarians to leave, and Earth is once again free. But the League is reeling. The world is scarred from this occupation. The Watchtower and Javelin, uh, you know, the League airship, are destroyed, and the League is voting on whether or not Shaira can even stay. As she waits, Shaira has a very sweet moment with Bruce's butler, Alfred, and this is by far one of my favorite scenes on the whole show. Without the great sacrifices you've made, we wouldn't be here to share this nice pot of tea. It's so small, but it's just so sincere and sweet, and it's ruining my life, thank you for asking. Afterwards, before the others can reveal their vote, Shaira resigns from the Justice League and heads out. I've spent the last five years torn between my feelings and my duty. I won't ask you to do the same. Therefore, I am resigning from the Justice League, effective immediately. She gets a hug with Flash and one last conversation with John, then flies off into the sunset to figure shit out on her own. And I... I am left drowning in a puddle of my own fucking tears because what the fuck has this show subjected me to? I love this. It's ruining my life. I just, this is everything. This is everything. In just one three-parter, the show has taken our comfy status quo, ripped it away, stomped on our spirits, poured salt into our wounds, and then gave us hope, gave us some nice aftercare, 
and basically just left us to pick up the pieces of our devastation. It is everything I could ever ask for in a piece of media. Yes, hello? I would like to be emotionally destroyed in every feasible way within 20 to 60 minutes, please. With a side of cries. Going forward, the show will never be the same. It is a true shift in the status quo and something that has changed the Justice League forever. Shaira is going to have to live with the consequences of her actions, and the others are going to have to recover from not only her betrayal, but the trauma of having nearly lost everything to the Thanagarians. Much like the Justice Lords, it is a pall that lingers in the air for the rest of the show's run. So two years have passed since the events of Starcrossed, and it's time for a new era. Justice League Unlimited, as a sequel series, features a completely different premise and structure from its original. Following the invasion, the Justice League has expanded to include pretty much every DC hero the writers were given access to, even the most obscure ones that literally no one has heard of before. Booster Gold! Who the hell is that? So rather than two-parters, we now get more episodic, self-contained stories featuring a small team of different characters. There's way more creative freedom now with the kinds of stories we can tell, and the show also becomes a bit more lighthearted as well. It doesn't feel watered down whatsoever. If anything, I appreciate the added wit and levity, especially because it makes the darker moments stand out even more by contrast. The original League members are still around, but it's not all about them anymore. We've got plenty of other heroes as well. Green Arrow, Black Canary, Supergirl, and more. And shockingly, the show does a great job endearing you to them immediately. You don't need to know anything about these characters beforehand from the comics or from previous DCAU shows, which I very much appreciate. I just adore this approach and story structure. And truth be told, I have rewatched Unlimited way more than the original series. I just really like being able to pick an episode, sit down, and enjoy a story from beginning to end in just 20 minutes. This show is a masterclass in tone balancing, pacing, handling an ensemble cast, and balancing episodic and overarching storytelling. And also, the intro slaps. Real quick, let's go over some of my favorite new additions to the Justice League. First up, Green Arrow, one of my many, many fictional husbands because he's perfect. I'll sure feel better, <laughs> but it'll make me a little cranky. I would say don't tell Wally, but like, I doubt he'd care. I had dinner with two women at the same time because I'm a stud. He's one of those superheroes without any superpowers, which makes him vital in the first story arc of Unlimited, which again, love this phrase, we will get to. Green Arrow is very focused on helping out the little guy. He's initially hesitant to join the Justice League, since in his view, their focus is all on the supervillains who threaten the world on a global scale, rather than helping everyday, ordinary people. I don't belong up here, fighting monsters and aliens and supervillains. I just help the little guy. And a big club like this, you tend to forget all about him. He helps the League remain down to earth and connected to regular folks. Not to mention, he's just so sweet. I love the big brother vibe he has with Supergirl, and I enjoy his banter with Question. These weren't just dreams, they felt like they really happened. Well, I don't know, I've had some dreams that felt mighty real. There was this one the other night. Given his insights and detective skills, Green Arrow kind of gives well-adjusted Batman energy. Like... Batman if he went to therapy and got his shit together. Supergirl, aka Kara Kent, is from the Superman animated series, but I really only know her from Unlimited. She's got all of Superman's abilities, but she's a lot more... immature. So you're gonna let me drive, right? Has she been certified in a javelin? Why don't you take the stick out, Corporal? She's very stubborn, very prideful, very hot-headed, and very gung-ho. But that does make sense, given she feels like she's got a lot to prove, being so young compared to the rest of the Justice League, and especially being the baby cousin of the world's favorite superhero. She plays a pretty important role during the Cadmus arc, which helps to mature Supergirl in facing up to the responsibilities the League must shoulder. She becomes much more mature in the third season, but thankfully doesn't lose that jovial, fun-loving spirit that makes her so endearing. Aren't you gonna give me notes about all the stuff I screwed up? No notes, Kara. I've got nothing left to teach you. 
Specifically, I love not only her dynamic with Green Arrow, but also with Green Lantern, since John serves as a harsh but caring mentor figure. If you ever jeopardize yourself or your teammates again by running off half-cocked without a battle plan, I will personally see to it that you are kicked out of the league. I don't care. I don't know, maybe Kara's hair color is green, despite the whole kryptonite thing. Now, the question. This whole trip might just prove the kids shouldn't eat nachos before bed. Peanut butter sandwiches. What? Do you go through my trash? Please. I go through everyone's trash. Hiding his face, Question is a massive conspiracy theorist, but thankfully, far more tolerable than the ones you probably know in your own life. Or the internet. This motherfucker is a fan favorite, and it isn't hard to see why. Question is a pure skeptic, seeking patterns where others wouldn't think to look, which winds up being incredibly useful when investigating certain government activities. Personally, if I knew Question, I wouldn't be able to fucking stand him, but he is a delight to watch, especially given his unbothered demeanor. Like, dude will sing bubblegum pop songs to himself as he casually breaks into a high security building. What a legend. Walked in my door, and now I don't wanna be alone no more. Huntress is another fun character. She actually gets kicked out of the League for trying to kill a criminal that the League is protecting, so for the rest of the show, she's this rogue ally who just kind of does her own thing. And will move within the limits of the law. That's why I quit. I absolutely love her in Double Date, but her attitude and cockiness make her a surprisingly fun, endearing character. Also, I live for her in Question's relationship. You're lucky to have me along. Hardly. You're drawn to my eccentric charm. No way in hell should these two work, and yet their chemistry is effortless. I am the ugliest guy of all time. Not in my eyes. Then we have Vixen, a high-class supermodel who is able to harness the abilities of animals with arguably the best visual accompaniment for said power. Like the animal-shaped wisps all around her, I live for this. Since John and Shaira are done, John has been dating Vixen, and while they're definitely not endgame, I still love Vixen's character and dynamic with them both. You can kiss, you can slap. I think men are just wonderful. I'll miss you. You better. She's level-headed, cool, and collected, and has the smoothest voice I've ever heard in my life. No, a romantic little spot I know in Beijing. She's got enough patience to make up for both John and Shaira, but that doesn't mean she's weak, not by a long shot. Not only do I enjoy the flirtier, calmer side of John she brings out, but I also really enjoy the friendly rivalry between her and Shaira when Shaira rejoins the League. For the last few months, all I've been hearing is Shaira's so brave, Shaira's so tough, but seeing you in action here, I'm thinking John must have been talking about some other Shaira. Vixen kind of helps in forcing Shaira to rekindle the flame of her righteous fury, since she's been, you know, burnt out ever since Starcrossed. If it's not clear, Unlimited introduces so many wonderful characters, and I haven't even talked about all the other ones that I love. And what's even more impressive is a lot of them are only really star characters in one or two episodes, and yet they're still so memorable. This show was written by witches. Witches, I tell you. Unlimited is split into three seasons, each consisting of 13 episodes. Well, sometimes you'll see it as two seasons, with the first one being 26. It's a bit of a mess. While the show is more episodic than its predecessor, it also features overarching stories, with the first two seasons being the Cadmus arc, which honestly is probably my favorite story arc from the show as a whole. Remember the whole Better World thing where the Justice Lords lost Flash, killed President Lex Luthor, and then took over the world? Well, to help stop the Justice Lords, Superman had to pardon our Lex Luthor and get him out of prison. And to do that, he had to disclose what exactly was going on that required letting him loose. And, uh, suffice to say, the US government did not exactly take the idea of being toppled by the Justice League very well. In response, they began Project Cadmus, a project bringing together powerful politicians, business leaders, and scientists to develop methods to fight back against the Justice League should they ever go rogue. We occasionally encounter them in the first season, with Supergirl discovering that she has been cloned. This clone, Galatea, has been trained by Cadmus to fight back against Superman and Supergirl, and Loki wants to get rid of Supergirl to assert her own existence. While she was seeing what you were doing, you were feeling her conscience. That's why you couldn't sleep at night. 
and I bet it got in the way of your work. It bites having someone in your head, doesn't it? Uh, yeah, the, the show does acknowledge what a sad, fucked up existence that is. Like, I do not like Alatea, but I also feel for her. Like, I do not envy her. Ooh, girl. The guy who created her, Professor Hamilton, was actually a surgeon who saved Supergirl's life back in the Superman series, but harvested her DNA from that surgery in order to create Galatea. It is a total violation that he justifies by citing Superman being turned against Earth by Darkseid. I thought you were a guardian angel come to answer our prayers, but Lucifer was an angel too, wasn't he? You stole Kara's DNA, violated her trust, my trust. Again, another Superman series thing, but this show gives you the necessary context. We love to see it. And when Galatea refers to Professor Hamilton as her dad. Goodbye, Daddy. I just, I feel so sad, but also so furious. And I'm here for this complicated mess. Later on, we learn that Project Cadmus has even been genetically engineering their own team of superheroes, the Ultimen. The purpose of the Cadmus project was to create a popular group of superheroes who are completely loyal to the government, unlike those loose cannons in the Justice League. They're parodies of infamous Super Friends characters, which again, is very funny for those who get the references. But beyond that, they're a tragic casualty of Cadmus ambitions. They were led to believe they were real people with their own families and pasts, but in truth are just test tube babies, nothing more than pawns in Cadmus schemes. I was with my mother when she died. I implanted memories, but I spent Thanksgiving with my father. Actors. And because of their nature, their forms will soon give out and they will die only to be replaced by another generation of Ultimen. <laughs> it is here we meet Amanda Waller, quite possibly one of the baddest bitches in media and Batman's best rival. Yeah, I said what I said. Who are you people? If I were you, I wouldn't probe the situation too closely, rich boy. That moment she clocks Batman's secret identity, the scream that I have scrumped every time I have rewatched this scene. Batman later confronts her directly in her own home, calling her out for her and Cadmus' actions, only to witness the clapback of the century as Waller points out why Cadmus deems their actions necessary. You've got a spaceship floating over our heads with a laser weapon pointing down. In another dimension, seven of you overthrew the government and assassinated the president. We're the good guys, protecting our country from a very real threat. You. And, uh, yeah, I, uh, I can see your point. I'm not shocked that the government would need a failsafe if the Justice League ever turned on them. It doesn't excuse any of Cadmus' actions, but it helps to explain them and make them a far more compelling, nuanced antagonist. Cadmus is partially bankrolled by Luthor, who now that he's out of prison is running for president. Uh, yeah, you can uh, probably tell that Superman is not taking this well. To the point that Luthor is able to pit him against Shazam, oh, sorry, uh, Captain Marvel, and destroy an entire city constructed by Luthor. All I wanted was for Superman to destroy the energy source. But battling Captain Marvel? It was more than I ever could have hoped for. Everything's going according to plan. But all of it is to prop up his own image while also destroying Superman's reputation. Yes, part of it is to help advance Cadmus' agenda, but it is also because Luthor just fucking hates Supes and wants him to suffer. What a hoe. When the question discovers the truth of the Justice Lord's rise to power, he confronts Superman for hiding this from the public and all of the Justice League outside the original Seven. He thoroughly believes this terrible fate will be inevitable so long as Lex Luthor lives. And so, he takes it upon himself to kill Luthor. A bold strategy, let's see how it pays off for him. Oh, it did not. That's unfortunate. Do you know how much power I'd have to give up to be president? So now, Soups teams up with Huntress to say, fuck the rules, we're saving our boy. They break into Cadmus headquarters, save question, fight another leaguer who's been turned against them, and roast Professor Hamilton on the way out. Cadmus basically takes this as a declaration of war, while the League argues amongst themselves as to whether they should escalate the conflict. What if you do decide to go marching down there, taking care of whoever you think is guilty? Who could stop you? Me? So you want the government to have a bunch of superhuman weapons just to keep us in check? No. I don't know. Yeah. And you know what? 
I get the league's apprehension, and I'm not really one to believe the state as people's best interests at heart. But I also get where Green Arrow is coming from in fearing what would happen if the Justice League actually did go rogue. Look, I'm an old lefty. The government must do for people what people can't do for themselves. The people sure can't protect themselves from the likes of us. Unfortunately, Luthor interrupts this debate by hacking into the Watchtower systems and using basically a nuclear warhead we saw in an earlier episode to destroy Cadmus headquarters. He assumes Waller and the rest of Cadmus will die in the blast, but they have already moved out following Superman's attack. Still, the blast devastates the surrounding area, and the public is not very trusting of the League, seemingly opening fire on them at random. You saw somebody took over the controls. It's our gun. If we didn't have it, they couldn't have used it. The original Seven decide to turn themselves into government custody as a show of good faith. Well, except Batman. He, uh, he has notes on this strategy. This is the single dumbest plan I've ever heard. Meanwhile, Galatea leads an army of Ultimen in a siege of the Watchtower, leading to an all-out war with the Unlimited members, and a final showdown with Supergirl. Batman confronts Waller again, finally getting her to open her eyes to the real enemy, Lex Luthor. He wants to be president. That's agenda enough for anybody. Almost anybody. All along, he had been using Cadmus resources to construct a nanotech form inspired by Amazo. Uh, you know, the, the big scary android guy? Yeah, he came back earlier this season and uh, Luthor studied his blueprints very closely. Luthor was hoping to move his consciousness into this thing to achieve godhood. But Waller said, I lived a bitch and I think the fuck not. Just as the OG7 rock up to help Waller stop Luthor, Brainiac shows up. I'd hoped to remain hidden until I could install myself into the android. But you forced my hand. Brainiac. Brainiac being a horrifying robot abomination that basically collects data from a world and then destroys it. And uh, uh, it's uh, it's nasty. This this was for kids. This was for kids. Oh, God. This twist is another thing that happened in the Superman animated series. A bit of an ass pull, but I'm willing to forgive it for the sake of the spectacle. Plus, as others have said before, there's no real right answer to the whole Cadmus story. And if anything, villains like Brainiac show exactly why the Justice League is needed in this terrifying world. But of course, Luthor and Brainiac are a match made in hell. Brainiac only follows his programming, but Luthor has greater ambitions for his power. I'm about to get everything I ever wanted. Power, ultimate knowledge, immortality. And you'll destroy the Earth to get it? It's business, Superman. There are always trade-offs. And uh, you should be very, very scared of those ambitions. Briefly, we get to fight nanotech recreations of the Justice Lords. Power corrupts after all, and who has more power than Superman? I wish it was a longer segment, but it's a nice moment seeing the Justice League overcome their inner demons that they have been wrestling with for the past two seasons. Do you think there's a single person on Thanagar or Earth who doesn't despise us? Luthor nearly kills Flash, but Flash manages to tap into his true power, literally Sonic punching Brainiac out of Luthor's body and destroying him. Flash nearly disappears, but the League manages to pull him back in one of the most heartfelt scenes of the whole show. Like, I cannot describe how much this wrecks me every time I rewatch. I can never go that fast again. If I do, I don't think I'm coming back. Addressing the public, the League nearly disbands, but Green Arrow calls them out. If you're quitting because you think you've already done your fair share, fine. But if you're quitting because it's easier than continuing the fight, then you're not the heroes we all thought you were. The world needs the Justice League, and the Justice League needs you, Superman. Having dragged the League for their behavior beforehand, this means a lot coming from him as he still sees the world as needing the League to protect and serve them. And from henceforth, we will get another status quo change, where the Justice League remains its own entity, but will work much more closely with the people that they serve, and even install a watchtower on Earth. And I love this. I adore the political messiness of this season, and the fact that the show is dedicated to portraying the nuance of this topic. Cadmus are still very clearly the bad guys, but you can understand why they're doing what they're doing. There are times watching that I am genuinely scared of Superman and the League going off the deep end. 
But even through all of that, you can still see that the League are trying their best. They do mean well. I'm not the man who killed President Luthor. Right now, I wish to heaven that I were, but I'm not. I just... Ooh. Ooh, the writing in the show is so good. God bless. So, outside the main plot, Unlimited has some banger episodes. And now let's talk about them, because I said so. First up, for the man who has everything. Good God, this one ruins me, and I thank it for it. Diana and Batman head to Superman's base, the Fortress of Solitude, to surprise him for his birthday. Bruce, you didn't get him a gift certificate. No. Cash. Only to find him in a trance with this ugly alien plant drilling into his goddamn chest. Oh dear God. This plant, the Black Mercy, feeds on the victim's life force while trapping them in a happy dream. Essentially, it locks you in Delulu land. And the Black Mercy was provided by Mongol, a returning villain from one of the most hated episodes of the original show. But uh, he is way scarier here. He's almost as strong as Superman and is incredibly violent, bloodthirsty, and misogynistic. Clearly the males on this world are the smart ones. He wants to know about the plant. Wonder Woman is powerful and an excellent warrior, but she gets utterly wrecked just trying to hold Mongol off. Still gotta give her credit. She did a damn good job. The fact that she's even alive is a miracle. Uh, How nice of you to volunteer to be the first of your race to die. <laughs> Soups, meanwhile, is trapped in a world where his homeworld of Krypton was never destroyed. He's grown, he's married to a loving wife, and he even has an adorable kid and doggo. I told you I didn't want a surprise party. And you're not getting one. It is a peaceful, happy life and nothing more, which makes it all the more painful as he realizes what's happening and has to let his dream world be destroyed in order to escape and help his friends in reality. You are everything I ever wanted in a son, but I've got responsibilities, Van. I have to go now. Oh, and to break your heart even more, Batman also gets bitten by the Black Mercy, and his dream is watching his dad beat the crap out of the guy who killed him and his wife. And as Diana cries out for Batman to wake up, how does he wake up? By witnessing his father's death. Bruce! I just... How am I meant to go on? In the end, Diana stops Mongol by launching the Black Mercy onto him. Excuse me. But I think this is yours. <laughs> what is he dreaming of? Murder. Lovely. But it's at least a bittersweet ending. Diana's gift was a special flower meant to resemble those of Krypton, but it was unfortunately killed in the fight. Still, it's a beautiful gift, and Superman is left with at least the comfort that he can still carry on the culture of his people and of his parents, even if they're all gone. God, this man needs a hug. On to a more lighthearted episode, This Little Piggy. The show has range, darling, range. Diana and Batman encounter Cersei. Yes, that Cersei. Cersei, be careful, she's- Yeah, I've read the Odyssey. Insert epic musical joke here. Cersei is looking to wreak a little havoc upon the mortal world, and to spite Hippolyta, she turns Diana into a pig. So now Batman is pig-sitting and tries to get the help of his magician friend Zatanna to turn her back. Diana kind of runs off, forcing a bunch of other heroes to go pig-hunting, and Diana too nearly wind up dying in a slaughterhouse. Um, Jesus. You know, it's, uh, it's surprisingly fucked up for such a a comedy-focused episode. In the meantime, Batman and Zatanna search for Cersei, at one point even asking for Medusa's help. Sophocles gonna start there, Aristophanes, all the big names. You know those statues at the entrance? Mine! Can I just say I live for the comedy in the show? Medusa is a goddamn mood. But Cersei? She's only present for this one episode, but she completely stole the show. You're both beginning to remind me of Sisyphus after a hard day pushing his boulder up the mountain. But me, I could keep this up all night. One of my favorite villains just from her attitude, her temper, 
and her musical talents. That's right, the bitch got out of Tartarus just so she could perform a cute little number to spite the goddamn sirens. What a queen. Lulu's back in town. In the end, Cersei agrees to turn Diana back, provided Batman give up something precious, his dignity. Am I blue? Okay, but real talk, Kevin Conroy's singing voice is gorgeous. May that legend, the one true Batman, rest in peace. He can Someone stop now. Made. Not on your life. But Batman is reluctant to ever admit his feelings, let alone show vulnerability. And what's more vulnerable than singing in public? Please don't answer that question. Diana is restored to human form, and I'm pretty sure Zatanna recorded that concert and showed her later. These two are so fucking cute, I swear. There is no way Batman ever acted on his feelings because he's convinced if he loves anybody, the universe will punish the shit out of him. But I do enjoy he and Diana's moments, and I live for how fed up Diana is by Batman's fear of connection. If my enemies knew I had someone special, they wouldn't rest until they'd gotten to me through her. Next. I know that Batman wound up alone, but you know, I really hope Diana found somebody nice. Oh yeah, I never got to mention it in the original section, but uh, there's an episode in the first series where Diana nearly dies stopping a missile and gets buried under the rubble when it crashes into the ground. Batman loses it trying to dig her out, and when Diana frees herself, Batman tries to hide all the dirt on his gloves, all like, I wasn't afraid for you. I, I totally don't have feelings for you. To which Diana quietly goes, Sure, Jan. And gives him a kiss on the cheek. It's so fucking cute. Next up is Wake the Dead. Remember Solomon Grundy? You know, the zombie who managed to die for real? Well, he's back now because some loser nerds decided to fuck around and find out. I'm coming! <laughs> Grundy has been revived, but is nothing like himself. He's just this violent brute going around destroying everything in sight, and he's being powered by ancient chaos magic that basically renders him invincible, even to powerful entities like Dr. Fate and Amazo. You know what would really help with that? An anti-magic mace. You disgust me. Join the club. Since Starcrossed, Shaira has been chilling out in Dr. Fate's tower, removed from the rest of the world and given a space to reflect. However, she's kind of become reclusive and has just been sulking and beating herself up the whole time. Flowers bloom when they're ready, Shaira. Not before. I'm no flower. I don't know what I am. I've been stripped of my rank, exiled from my homeworld. I'm not Hawk Girl. That was always a sham. She hates herself for betraying Thanagar, but she also hates herself for deceiving the Justice League and betraying Earth as well. She has spent years living a lie and doesn't know how to move on now that she has lost everything. But in this moment, when Grundy is in need, Shaira steps in because that's her friend suffering. I'm ready. Ultimately, she is the one who has to stop him, since only her mace has the power to stop the magic that has brought him back. And it is one of the most heart-wrenching, tragic moments I've ever seen. Close your eyes. In the end, the crowd curses at Shaira, but a mother and daughter that she saved thank her. It's something small, but it's a start to her living up to becoming a hero again. You saved our lives. God bless you, Chicalcon. You deserve that, too. We also get the revelation of the Justice League's votes here. John abstained, given his biases. Batman and Diana voted for Shaira to leave, given Diana's fury and Batman's Batman-ness. And Flash, Jean, and Superman voted for her to stay. Superman's moment of support here? I believe in second chances. I believe in redemption. But mostly, I believe in my friends. Oh, it warms my heart. It unfortunately winds up fueling the public outrage towards the Justice League since the world pretty much still hates Shaira, 
still referring to her as Hawk Girl, even though she has discarded that persona and very much hates it. Your people, Hawk Girl. I've told you not to call me. And Shaira has still got a lot of work to do. Regaining her confidence, facing the Thanagarian she betrayed again, figuring out her new dynamic with John and Vixen, and mending fences with Diana. Something I especially love about her story from here on is the visual representation of her change. She doesn't go by Hawk Girl anymore, nor does she don a mask or a superhero outfit. It's just her. A lot of folks make fun of the yoga pants look, but I don't really mind it all that much. In fact, I kind of prefer this to her Hawk Girl look, because it's just her. It's just Shaira. No more lies, no more masks, just a woman who fucked up trying to do better. Also really love her image in the opening. It shows all the original members, but up until this point, it's just been the six who are still in the league. But in Wake the Dead, Shaira is reintroduced, and she's not in a superhero outfit. She's just in a normal outfit. She's not in a warrior pose. She's just kind of staring at the camera. It makes me think of that line in season three about Shaira loving the sunrise because the background colors also resemble a sunrise. You get up early because you love the sunrise. Oh, it's just, it's so beautiful. Oh, chills. And I'm also a huge fan of the episode The Balance, since that focuses on the conflict between Diana and Shaira. As the only women on the original team, and given Diana grew up in a culture of only women, it's easy to presume Diana would look at Shaira like a sister. A sister who understands man's world and can help her to navigate it. I especially love the episode Fury from the original series for this reason. So in The Balance, where Faust the foe who instigated the conflict which led to Diana being banished from Themyscira, usurps Hades and takes over the underworld. The subsequent chaos causes all the Justice League's magic users to lose control of themselves. And so, Diana has to return home and get Hades back on the throne, despite the fact that she fucking hates Hades, because, you know, he empowered Faust in the first place last time to escape and also tried to kidnap Hippolyta. To take down a magical foe, you naturally need some anti-magic. And what's Diana's solution? Steal Shaira's mace. Can I have it? It's a package deal. You want the mace? You get me too. They ask you how you are, you just have to say that you're fine. But Shaira ain't having that, so we get a reluctant team up where together they kick Faust's ass and save Hades, in the process, kind of restoring their friendship. Are we good? Like oil and vinegar. We go together, but we don't mix. Works for me. You know, they're never going to be besties, but I love the camaraderie they managed to build between them. Also, little thing here, Diana, like in her pre-New 52 backstory, was sculpted from clay by Hippolyta and brought to life by the gods. You know, brought into the world without a man because insert bad Katy Perry song here. But Hades suggests that she wasn't created alone, if you catch my drift. I don't have a father. My mother sculpted me from clay and breathed life into me. Your mother and I sculpted you together. It's never confirmed or denied, but Diana, I think, comes to a pretty solid conclusion. Who the fuck cares? Use the lasso on him. Make him tell the truth. The real truth is, it doesn't matter. I know what I need to know. I know who raised me, and I know what I was raised to do. I love this for her. But for the record, the idea of Diana being the daughter of Hades and princess of the underworld... I do kind of live for it, especially because admittedly, I am still annoyed Justice League bought into the whole Hades equals Satan, so therefore Hades evil thing. Yes, I am one of those bitches. Get over it, okay? But Diana being Hades' daughter would be so cool. It's also giving the Percy Jackson effect where instead of being the child of the Greek god everybody thinks of, you're the kid of another less recognized god. It's just refreshing. I could go on about more episodes I enjoy, like Hunter's Moon or Double Date or Patriot Act. But quite frankly, this script is long enough, and I would not be shocked if this video wound up being, I don't know, fucking two hours or something. I'm a maniac. But I think at this point, it is clear just how compelling and well-written this show as a whole is. Because of unlimited structure, it's able to tell so many unique stories with different characters without overwhelming the viewer or requiring them to have pre-existing knowledge to enjoy the story. Top tier shit. So, yeah, I'm a big Justice League fan obviously. It is an excellent series with compelling characters, engaging stories, and mature themes that were absolutely ahead of their time. It is still beloved by nerds aplenty, but I'm here to tell you that if you haven't seen it, you should. And you know what? If this does well, 
Maybe I'll make videos of myself getting into the other entries in the DCAU. That sounds fun. Anyhow, if you enjoyed this video and would like to see more content like this from me, then be sure to subscribe and ring that bell for notifications because YouTube hates creators. Also, please consider, if you're willing and able, pledging your support for myself and the channel over on Patreon. I'm the Unicorn of War, and not gonna lie, Shire's entire life is a goddamn shit show.